never be afraid. There's nothing which is known which can't be understood. And there's nothing which is understood which can't be explained. For over 50 episodes now, my team and I have brought you to the very frontier of knowledge in physics and astronomy. And still, our mission goes on. To present you with your birthright, an understanding of the universe. I've traveled the world seeking out a certain type of genius. Masters of not only their academic disciplines, but also at explaining their research in understandable ways. And I've bestowed upon these women and men the title of Titanium Physicist. You're listening to the Titanium Physicist Podcast, and I'm Ben Tippett. And now, L.A. Physique! I'm really bad at archery. About this time last year, my wife and I decided to start learning archery, so we bought a couple of recurve bows at the archery shop, and they gave us a free half-hour lesson, and then we just started attending bi-weekly archery nights at our local fish and game club. Anyway, like I said, I'm kind of bad at it. Here's the thing, when I pull back an arrow and let it go, it won't always go in the direction I've aimed the bow. And that's because I have bad technique. So yeah, little things like how I'm holding the string, how I line up the shot, how I let go of the string, how I hold the bow, they're all slightly different each time, and these differences add up. So, the arrow mostly goes in the direction I point it, give or take, but it means that after I've shot a couple arrows, they all are kind of spread out on the target around near the point I aimed at. So why do I care? Well... Suppose I go blind and decide to suddenly start sensing the world around me by shooting arrows at things and listening to the sounds they make when the arrows hit them. You know, I'd aim the arrow to the left and let it fly, and then I hear a quack, and then I'm like, yes, there's a duck over there to the left. And I aim an arrow to the right, and I let fly, and bonk, okay, it's concrete wall over there, okay? So the bad archery technique would present a problem with this plan, because the arrows aren't necessarily going where I aim the bow. I don't know if the duck I heard quack was exactly where I aimed it at, or off to the left, or right, or above it. I only have a vague sense of where these things lie. And this is relevant when we want to talk about looking at stuff. Those of you who are nearsighted, now's a good time to take off your glasses to see what I mean. Unless you're driving, hold on, then pull over and take off your glasses. There are different aspects to seeing things. Sure, recognizing color is part of it, detecting light is part of it, but one big thing that's super desirable when you're looking at things is the capacity to be able to differentiate between an object and the stuff you see around it. The reason you shouldn't drive with your glasses off is because the light is no longer properly focused in your eyes and the shape of everything becomes blurred and you can no longer tell where an oncoming car ends and the road begins. So even though you see the lights from their oncoming headlights, you can't quite tell where it's coming from. It's the same problem as the one with the bad archery. So the issue here is called angular resolution. If you were to put a protractor up to your eyes, you could be able to describe the limits of your capacity to see things in terms of how many degrees wide the smallest things you can see are. I'm nearsighted, but with glasses, I've got pretty good angular resolution. I can see the details of the craters on the moon, and I can see the silhouettes of trees on the faraway mountains. But without my glasses, I can't distinguish between the hairs on my arm, for instance. Now, okay, okay, so the reason I'm going on and about on about this, and it's really neat, there are fundamental limits to a lens's angular resolution. Even if the lens in my eye is perfect and I don't need glasses, there are still limits to how far away I can see. And the basic limit is this. The smaller the diameter of the lens, the smaller its angular resolution is going to be, and the less detail it's able to resolve. This has to do with the wave nature of light and interference, but the limit is actually the ratio between the width of the lens and the wavelength of the light. 
Now, big lenses offer two benefits. First, they catch a lot of light. That's why fish at the bottom of the ocean have really big eyes. And that's why telescopes and binoculars have such wide lenses. Fewer photons means that you need a really wide net to catch enough to make an image. But the second is that the wider a lens you have, the better the angular resolution it offers. So the smaller your eye's diameter is, the less detail you can see. Ant lions are a type of bug that eat ants. They don't look like lions, but to ants, they're lions. These have really, really little eyes. And as a result, their angular resolution is only about 5 to 10 degrees. And that's enough only to see an ant that's maybe a centimeter away from it. And which does its job. I mean, it's not going to jump on an ant that's two centimeters away from it. But it's absolutely crazy. They're, they're super blind. And not because their eyes are bad, just because their eyes are too small. Okay, so telescopes. This is, get back to telescopes. You point your telescope in a certain direction and you see some light. The angular resolution of the telescope tells you whether the light you detected is really coming from the direction you pointed the telescope or off to the side somewhere. Radio telescopes have a really, really bad angular resolution. This is because radio waves are so long. This is why radio telescopes need to be so wide. And I'm sure you're familiar with the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. It's this huge one from the movie Contact and the James Bond movie and the episode from the X-Files. And it's 300 meters wide. And compare that to my eye, which is about 2 centimeters wide. The Arecibo telescope is 15,000 times wider than my eye. But... The radio waves it receives have a wavelength that are like 6,000 times wider than the visible light that my eyes are receiving. And that means that as big as it is, the Arecibo telescope has a worse angular resolution than my eye. If it looked at the moon, it couldn't see all the details. It couldn't see the craters or the man in the moon because as a lens, the radio telescope is too small, even though it's 300 meters wide. So... So here's the thing. Astronomers have figured out a trick to let them get beyond this limit. And harnessing this trick, we've been able to use radio telescopes to see the finest details in the universe. Today on the Titanium Physicist Podcast, we're going to be talking about radio interferometry. So speaking of radio, a particular very influential format of radio show has really fallen out of favor in this day and age. Well, you know, before this day and age, broadcast television killed it the way the internet is killing broadcast television. I'm talking about the serial radio drama. I'm talking about the golden age of radio. I'm talking about Red Rider, Flash Gordon. I'm talking about Superman and Lights Out and the Whistler and the Shadow. I'm talking about Foley artists making sound effects of opening and closing doors and people walking across floors. Oh man, fun times. Just because the radio no longer plays clever serial drama doesn't mean that the format is dead. No, no, no. It's found a huge audience on the internet. The Thrilling Adventure Hour is one of the most creative podcasts ever, featuring talents like Paul F. Tompkins. The Thrilling Adventure Hour is a podcast that takes all those old-timey tropes and shuffles them together in new and fun way. Amelia Earhart fights Nazis through times. Sparks Nevada is a marshal on Mars. Frank and Sadie Doyle are alcoholic socialites who help ghosts solve their personal problems. The Thrilling Adventure Hour was produced for over 10 years, and it ended just this autumn. But the Work Juice Theater is doing a show at San Francisco Fest. January 9th today, my guest is one of the two co-authors of the Thrilling Adventure Hour. It's Ben Acker. Hello, Ben. Well, hello. For you today, I've got two fantastic titanium physicists. Arise, Dr. Rapinder Brar. <laughs> Dr. Rapinder did his PhD at Queen's University, and he's currently a senior lecturer of physics and astronomy at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. In 2010, he won TV Ontario's award for best lecturer in the world. Now arise, Dr. Sabrina Steerwalt. Dr. Sabrina did her PhD at Cornell, and she's currently a staff scientist at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. In 2014, she was a L'Oreal for Women in Science fellow, and she has a podcast called Everyday Einstein with Quick and Dirty Tips series. All right, everybody, let's start talking about radio interferometry. Uh, so, Ben, let's just say you wanted to watch a movie, right? And uh, let's say you wanted to watch Contact. Have you seen this movie, Contact, by any chance? I have not. Okay, but let's say you were going to choose to watch Contact. Totally Would you rather watch it on Blu-ray or on VHS? Oh, man, I would rather watch it on Blu-ray. Did I walk awesome. right into your trap? No, no, you're totally right. You're totally right. 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 And so the biggest difference between those formats is exactly what we're talking about today. It's the resolution, right? You want to 
see the details of Jodie Foster's science as much as possible. And you're going to do that with a high-resolution TV uh, coupled with a Blu-ray player, getting as fine a detail uh, of those lovely radio telescopes that she uses. That is until the 4K version comes out, which I'm hoping is sometime soon. And so just like TV, we keep making higher and higher resolution televisions we want higher and higher resolution telescopes. There's really just two things that a telescope does. It makes dim things brighter and it makes small things well, – that's not quite the right word. Not small things bigger because that's, that's just zooming. That's not what we're looking for. We want to be able to resolve smaller details. And so the bigger the telescope – the dimmer the object we can see and the higher the resolution of the picture that we can make. The contrast here is like normal resolution television, old-fashioned television, you get really close to the screen and you see big pixels, right? The higher definition ones, you can get much closer and still see little background details and the pores in people's skin and stuff. And that's essentially the advantage that Rapinder's talking about. The bigger the telescope is, the more resolution we get, the more of the finer details we can make out. And that's super important in astronomy because everything is really far away. Sure, the things in our solar system are relatively close, but even just looking at the, the surface of a star, which sounds like a, sort of a basic thing astronomy should be able to do, is actually really, really tough. Stars are so far away that resolving a star beyond just a, a pinpoint of light to and actually seeing the disk of a star is really quite a challenge. Agreed. <laughs> so you would think that we could just keep making our telescopes bigger and bigger, right? If we want to get more light, we want to get better resolution, we want to get better sensitivity, you can just keep building bigger and bigger telescopes until a certain point. You get to a point where that's just not structurally feasible. Yeah, so, the telescope will uh, fall right over, right? Well, yeah. So, well, first, Ben mentioned the Arecibo telescope, 300 meters in diameter, but it sits in a sinkhole in Arecibo. So they were going to build this big dish. They said, let's just put it where there's already a hole in the ground. So there's a sinkhole in Puerto Rico where they've built this dish, and that means they can't steer it. So it just sits like a big old bowl, and you can't steer it around. I believe in GoldenEye, they flushed it like a big toilet. They acted like it was underwater. It's not actually underwater. But you can't steer it, so you're just forced to look at whatever goes overhead, basically, to some extent. So we built the Green Bank Telescope, which is the largest steerable man-made device. So they built this huge telescope in the radio quiet zone in West Virginia. But the problem with that telescope was they made it so big that it fell over the first time. And they thought, hey, we're building this engineering marvel, this biggest steerable device. Let's put it right over the place where the operator sits. And so sure enough, this huge steerable telescope fell down, crushing the operator's desk. Uh, but I'm laughing because the operator actually had been sitting there all night, but in these five minutes decided to take a break and head to the shitter and was saved. So nobody was hurt in the falling over of the Green Bank Telescope because of a very fortunately timed bathroom break. Uh, but the moral of the story is not only go to the bathroom when you need to go, but also just we can't just keep building bigger and bigger telescopes because we hit a limit where it's just not structurally feasible anymore. And so we have to come up with a different technique. Uh, and that's where interferometry comes in. So as it stands, the bigger telescope, the better. But I'm not sure if you've noticed, there's different types of telescopes out there. There are the ones that look like tubes, or they have big mirrors, they're optical telescopes. Like uh, the ones on Hawaii, I'm sure you've seen. There's an observatory in LA that's on an optical observatory. And it's just like a traditional telescope. Classic telescope business. Yeah. And they're usually like about, you know, five to 12 meters in diameter, just a, just a single mirror bouncing light to a secondary mirror and then uh, to a CCD, standard telescope stuff. Textbook telescopes. Exactly. I want to tell you about those weird, giant, space-looking telescopes, the, the ones that look like big satellite dishes. Okay. okay, let's get into that. You're familiar with those ones? They're usually out in the desert somewhere, and they're huge. They're like the width of a building, and they're big, bowl-shaped uh, 
they look like satellite dishes. For a good reason, they essentially do that. You familiar with those ones? Unfamiliar, but I trust you. Unfamiliar? Hmm. I guarantee you that you know what shape they're in, though. Oh, yeah, no, I'm familiar with shapes. Okay, you just... Just not those telescopes. So they're just big, wide bolts, and they're usually kind of tilted off to an angle, and you can make them point in different directions. Yeah, I mean, they look basically like your standard satellite dish that you probably had on your house in 1995, uh, getting signals from some satellite, but instead they're much larger, uh, reading similar signals from deep space. So they're radio telescopes. The reason they aren't mirrored like a mirror, they're not shiny, is because radio waves are so wide that they bounce off just pieces of metal. So you don't even need a a sheer piece of metal that's shiny. You can use kind of a grating, like a barbecue grate, and they'll bounce off. So uh, they're cheap to make because, you know, a grating doesn't have much mass, so you don't need much supporting understructure to keep it in place. And you can make them really, really, really big. And the tolerances of them are pretty... Like, if you grind a mirror, uh, Mm -hmm. an optical mirror, and you're off by, like, a couple microns, everything's done. It's over, Mm -hmm. right? It, It won't focus the image properly. But because the wavelength of radio waves are so wide, the the tolerances on building one of these things are are much more forgiving. And so you can make them really, really big, and they have. This is why they can't make a mirror the size of a building for an optical telescope because it's too big. It'll be too heavy. But you can make an underlying understructure holding up one of these building-sized radio telescopes just fine. And so they do. I mean, they're essentially, they work on the same principle as your parabolic reflecting telescopes. Yeah, so the Arecibo dish isn't actually solid, like you were saying. And when people go out to fine-tune it and, and turn all the screws every now and then, they have to wear these special shoes that have, like, basically huge flat pieces and then you strap your foot into them and then you can walk around, like, with these big massive feet so that you don't fall through. Cool. It works in the same type of way as an optical telescope, only it's cheaper to build and you can build really, really, really big ones. And it detects radio waves instead of uh, light. And we should we should mention, like, what is a radio wave? Like, are we listening for music from uh, gas cloud in space? No, radio light, we can call it radio light because really it's just identical to the light that we can see. It's just a different size. That's it. So light or electromagnetic radiation comes in all different sizes, all the way from the very, very small, like gamma rays, X-rays, Uh, UV light to the very big. So beyond the optical, we've got microwave and then eventually radio. But, But essentially, there's nothing different about it. It's just that when we think of light, we think of the light that our eyes are sensitive to as being something special. But astronomically, there's there's nothing special about it. Biologically, sure, it's special to us. But black holes and neutron stars and cool things in space don't really care that we can see in this tiny, tiny little part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The universe is cool at all wavelengths, at all sizes of light. And so... If we can observe at different wavelengths, you know, we want to. You just blew my mind. And and one other thing is is that like living here on Earth, which you know, it's a total bummer, right? What um, best planet? Come on, best planet. <laughs> here's the problem with the Earth, though. It's got this thing called the atmosphere, which is sure it's great Ooh, for atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For biological light, it protects us from like radiation and other yeah. things in space, it, it only allows it two tiny, tiny little portions of that giant electromagnetic spectrum. It allows invisible light, which is great for us to see into space, and radio light. Those are the only two that actually make it all the way to the surface of the Earth. And that's why radio astronomy is sort of like the you know little brother of visual light astronomy because we can look into outer space just by creating some kind of device that's sensitive to this radio light coming from space. Right, but whereas optical astronomy has been around since you know fifteen sixteen hundreds, Galileo radio astronomy has only really been developed since about World War Two. So we're just hitting our stride, figuring out what sort of radio emissions are coming from stars, galaxies, black holes, like Rupinder said, whereas we've been looking at this stuff for many more hundreds of years in the optical. 
Now, before we go on, we should maybe talk about the angular resolution stuff I, I started the show with. Because radio telescopes have really bad angular resolution. But to get into that, we have to talk about what the light's doing and why the telescope is bowl-shaped. Okay? So it's not just bowl-shaped. It has a very specific curvature to it called parabolic curvature. It's shaped like a parabola, uh, which is a geometric shape that isn't round like a sphere, but it's also not flat like a piece of paper. It's curved in a very specific way. And the specific way it's curved has very desirable geometric properties. These properties are often described in terms of focusing rays of light. And so the idea here, I'm sure you've seen one of these diagrams, is the light comes in, there's multiple parallel rays coming in like like laser beams from something. So they'll come in parallel to one each other, straight down, and then they'll bounce off the mirror. And when they bounce, they'll all bounce off in different directions, but they'll all end up crossing at one specific point. And that point is called the focal point. Are you, are you vaguely familiar with this mental image that I'm trying to draw? Yes. Okay. So the deal is with one of these telescopes is you take a big mirror and then you point it at the star you want to look at and then you take your little camera and you put it at the focal point and then all the light from that star comes in and bounces off the mirror and goes into your camera at the focal point and it's like you've got a great big eye the size of the mirror instead of an eye the size of your camera so there are various benefits to this but before we go on i want to talk about another way to introduce how this thing works. It doesn't just amplify the light because all the light comes in and bounces off and gets collected together at a point. There's also a really neat element to this that involves the timing of when the signal comes in and how it's collected. It it has to do with the wave nature of light. Um, So I'm sure you've heard that light is a wave, right? Mm -hmm. You've heard it. Everybody's heard it. My favorite song. Yeah. So one way to imagine it is you're sitting on on a beach and there are waves coming towards you. Each of these waves is essentially one big, long hill, right? Mm -hmm. The points on the hill are all getting closer to to the beach at the same time. It's it's a big, flat wave, right? That's that's what we're going to start imagining. Um, So we can talk about what happens when two waves cross one another, okay? If two waves cross each other, they'll just pass right through each other. And so overall, if I was standing on on a jet ski or something and two waves were to pass under me at the same time, the change in height that I would feel would be a combination of the two waves. So if both peaks were passing under me, I'd be really high up. And if both troughs were passing under me, I'd be really low down. And if the peak of one was passing while the trough of the other was passing, they would kind of cancel out, okay? So this fact that... How they add together causes a cancellation in height. They can cancel one another out or they can amplify each other. This is called interference. And I'm sure that you've heard of this. It's really popular with sound. You've, you've had noise-canceling headphones before, right? Let's say yes. Let's, yes. We'll, yeah. we'll presume that you're rich enough to own noise-canceling headphones, like the kind they sold in Sky Mall, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So what those do is uh, sound is a type of wave. They're pressure waves. Uh, there's a little speaker inside the noise canceling headphones, and what they do is they listen to the sound coming in towards your ears, and they produce the same sound but offset by a little bit. So it produces its own wave that partially cancels out the wave that's coming in, and so in the end you hear less noise. So it's not just muffling out the sound, it's actively canceling it using interference. Oh, so much science in your earballs. I know, it's crazy. What happens when a wave hits one of these big curved telescopes? Um, Essentially, what will happen is, as the wave hits the telescope, it'll hit different parts of the surface of the telescope at different times. Just like imagine a big wave washing up into an inlet. It touches the inlet at different times, depending on how deep the wave has penetrated into the inlet, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so same thing happens in your telescope. And every time the wave edge hits the edge of the telescope, it's going to reflect a little bit of wave in, in, in just random directions, okay? Wait, what? It's going to bounce off. It's going to generate its own wave. So you're bouncing off a thing with a thing. 
Yeah, so so it generates kind of a new wave. The wave just bounces off, and so and so that the wave that bounces off will interfere with the rest of the wave. It'll bounce off. It'll do its own thing. The easiest way to think about this is to imagine. Think about a gymnasium. Okay, so you're a gym teacher. And you've decided to make all the stupid kids race. And you're like, okay, you stupid kids. You're going to race. We're going to see which one of you is fastest. But here's the thing. You know beforehand that all of them run at exactly the same speed, right? You're at a very dull school where none of them are fast. They're all just running at the same speed. No wonder this gym teacher hates his job. Yeah, right. I know. You want to favor Don't blame it on the kids, though, gym teacher. Look inward. (laughs) Look inward. So the gym teacher goes and he lines them up all against a line on the, mm-hmm. on the back of the gymnasium. And then he goes, uh, you got to cross this tape. Whoever crosses this tape first wins. And so he puts a little X on the ground and he goes, okay, cross it. And who wins? The one closest to the tape, right? Mm-hmm. So the parents phone in. They complain. They're like, well, Johnny runs just as fast as Susan, but Susan won the race, and you gave her the chocolates, and we disagree. She shouldn't get an A. Everybody should get the same grade. We know these kids run at the same speed. So the gym teacher decides to make a, uh, a slightly different test. And so what the gym teacher does is he goes, okay, I'm going to uh, take a piece of tape, and around this little point, I'm going to draw a U shape that faces outwards towards the back end of the gymnasium, okay? So all the kids are lined up along a line on the north end of the gymnasium, and then there's the target point that's in the middle of the basketball key, right in the middle, and then around that, kind of facing the kids, he's drawn a big U shape in tape, okay? Mm -hmm. And he says to the kid, okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to run straight towards the other end of the gymnasium. You're at the north side, you're going to run straight south, And then when you reach this tape U that I've drawn, you're going to touch the ground, and then you're going to run to this dot. And the kids go, yeah, okay, this seems arbitrary. And he's like, whatever, they're wind sprints. You just get support to run. The idea is that you can design the U-shaped tape so that it has a really specific shape, this parabolic shape, where the kids will run in, touch that U-shape, and then run towards the middle. And if the U is shaped like a parabola... What will happen is, because the kids run at the same speed, they'll all arrive at that X at the same time. The idea is, they're all traveling on different paths. Some of them hit the tape early and then have to turn and run towards the X. Some of them hit the tape really late and they have to run to the back of the gym, touch the bottom of the U, and then turn around. They all run different paths, but because of Greek geometry, we know that it's going to take them all the same amount of time to arrive at the X. Now... If we were going to talk about waves, if we're going to break down the wave front as in terms of these little kids all running forward, bouncing off the mirror, running towards the X, what it means is all of those rebounded wave fronts that bounce off the mirror are all going to arrive at the focal point at the same time. That was well explained. Oh, thanks. So they all arrive at the same time. And we talked about how waves add together, right? And so what will happen is all those waves will add together at the same point at the same time. And you'll get a really big wave. They'll all add together. You'll get a huge amplification at that point. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially how these telescopes work is that the light comes in and this wave of light will get bounced off this parabolic shape in a way that causes it to have a huge amplification right at the focus because it takes the light the same amount of time to bounce off the mirror and arrive at the focus. Yeah, thanks to a gym class of well-meaning, same-running children. That's right. So one other particular aspect of this is that suppose you're in the gym class of running children and they set up the U and they did the thing and then it's a substitute teacher's day to come in and run the children. And the substitute teacher doesn't know where to start the children lining up. So the substitute teacher takes another piece of tape and runs a line across the gym where all the kids line up, but it's not parallel to the baseline of the basketball court. It's kind of at an angle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you start the children running What'll happen is they won't all touch the U and arrive at the focus at the same time. The only way they'll all arrive at the focal point at the same time is if they start running on a line parallel to the baseline of the basketball court. Any other configuration, they won't all arrive at the same time. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. It has to do with you know, how they started out. But in telescopes, this means something absolutely crazy. It means that if I take a telescope and point it straight up, 
the mm-hmm. light from a star coming straight down at me will get amplified at the focal point. On the other hand, light coming from an angle that's just a little bit off, straight up vertical, it'll be moving in a way that the light won't bounce off the mirror and amplify itself at the focal point. When the light reaches the focal point in that case, it will be partially canceled out. It'll be a weaker signal than it should be. Mm-hmm. So this parabolic mirror gives us the advantage that not only can we amplify the light that's coming in from straight above, but it also kind of unamplifies, it makes the signal weaker coming from directions that are off axis. And so this is useful. It's kind of like that archery thing I started with. What you can do is you can use this to figure out exactly where these stars are because you can tweak the direction of the telescope And depending on where pointing the telescope, you get the strongest signal. That's the direction it lies. It kind of reminds me of when I was a kid. I went to a science camp where, you know how they they put radio tracking collars on bears? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So essentially, it's like finding the direction of the bear. So essentially, the the radio tracking collar is making a ticking sound. And you've got an antenna, and it's directional. And you can twist it around and figure out which direction the loudest signal is coming from, and that's the direction of your bear. Similarly, we can take these radio telescopes and twist them around, tilt them in different directions, and we know that wherever it's loudest, that's where the sources of the radio emissions are coming from. So it's helpful because we can't see with our eyes where all the radio stars are or anything. All all we have is a machine that tells us if it's getting a loud signal or a quiet signal. So we can use pointing it in different directions to figure out where the loud things are, loud structures. Oh, man. So you're using audio words for visual things. I get it. I get it. But I was just uh, getting on board with the idea that there's visual stuff you can't see. And now you're talking about loud instead of bright. It's fine. It's fine. Term of art. Okay, so the deal is, it's like we said, when we point the telescope in a particular direction and it's loud, we know that there is something in that direction that's making Mm -hmm. those radio waves. Maybe it's a weird star, maybe it's an alien artifact, who knows. But because of the wave nature of light, there's a weakness to this, which is to say that we don't know exactly which direction it's coming from. We just have kind of a cone that we know that it's coming from, right? There's some angular error involved in it. It might be a little bit to the left of it. It might be a little bit to the right of it. We know the yeah. general direction. And the thing with radio, like I said at the start of the show, is that radio has really, really long wavelengths. And this translates to, essentially, all these great things like that the the atmosphere is uh, transparent to radio. It has other benefits, right? But one of the weaknesses is because it has such a long wavelength, the error on which direction we think the thing is coming from, those, those error bars are really big. So we're not sure whether it comes from a lot to the left or a lot to the right. And even really, really big telescopes like Arecibo, which is absolutely huge. You can walk around inside of it. You could could live in it if you wanted to. If you wanted to live inside a bowl for some reason. Even Arecibo doesn't have all that great angular resolution. Like I said, our eyes have better angular resolution. Our eyes can see finer detail than the Arecibo telescope. So they figured out a trick called radio interferometry that lets us see everything in finer detail. Okay, so interferometry is kind of a clever <laughs> They call it trick. the cleverest trick the devil ever played, right? That's right. The easiest way to explain it is, so the wider the telescope is, the better the angular resolution, the more detail we can see, right? And you need like a kilometers wide telescope to see really fine angular resolution in radio, just because the radio waves have such a long wavelength. So the argument goes like this. Imagine you had a radio telescope that was kilometers wide. Why don't we build one? And the answer is, engineering-wise, it's too much. It's going to fall on somebody's desk? Yeah, it's, they're just too big, right? Yeah. You're not going to build something I'm, kilometers and kilometers wide Ridiculous. that's U-shaped, because the sides would have to be really tall. So it's yeah. like, we need to do let's, something let's else. Let's do it. Yeah, whatever that is. Let's do it. So imagine that we did have one of these. Yeah, that'll that we solve covered it. That'll solve with the tarp. The tarp. You know, oh, imagine it was your tarp. 10 kilometers Magic wide. tarp we covered theory. covered it with a tarp. Yeah, let's cover it with a tarp. That'll do. But then we cut holes in it. Imagine you cut three holes in it. One, one near the edge, one near the center, one somewhere in the middle. So Just this little, this, you know, 200 meter this wide. This telescope hole. is dressed like a ghost now, a Halloween ghost. <laughs> okay. All right. Perfect. 
That yeah, yeah that's I don't great. see any structural issues now that it has a tarp on it with three holes in it. Even with the two or three holes in it, it would still have the angular resolution of the okay. kilometer wide telescope. All right, I see. It would just not receive mm-hmm. as much light, so the light would be dimmer because it only lets through at three places, but it would still have this angular resolution. So effectively, what we do is we set up multiple small telescopes in a way that gives us essentially the same thing. We add up their signal in such a way that it acts like right. a kilometer-wide telescope, only with a few holes drilled in it. You win this, you win this round. Let's so basically, do, let's... at its core, a radio interferometer could have like 20 dishes, 30 dishes. Each one itself is a telescope, but really they're just one telescope each dish giving us part of the picture in a way, right? And so overall, if let's say I have 30 dishes and and they're spread across five kilometers, it's the equivalent of having a single telescope that has a dish five kilometers across. It's equivalent for resolution. It's just not equivalent for the amount of light I collect. I won't get as dim a picture as I would if I had one giant telescope, but I should get just about as good a a high-definition picture as if I had one giant telescope. Right. So basically, some of that light is going to fall in between the cracks of your Mm -hmm. telescopes because you don't have a uniform piece. You're getting the same high-resolution image, but you're missing some of the light that falls in between the telescopes. You're getting the same image, but you're not... But you're not getting the same light? Or are you getting an image with holes in it? Uh, you're getting the same angular resolution okay. image. All right. Imagine it's like this. Let's say that um, you were watching, you know, a nice HD movie on your laptop or something, and then you mm-hmm. start turning the the dimness down on your computer screen. You still have the resolution that you had originally, but maybe you're starting to miss things because uh, the screen's just not as bright as it was otherwise. That's what it's like. Gotcha. So you end up missing things that are more spread out because those tend to be fainter. You can't pick those things up. So you're getting denser stuff that's brighter, uh, so you Mm -hmm. can see a lot more detail. But things that are sort of diffuse and spread out, uh, you miss with this, with interferometry. All right, I'll take it, though. Sounds Sounds like the best option. The way interferometry works isn't that you have a 10 kilometer wide telescope with holes covered with a tarp with holes drilled in the top. What happens is it's like you had individual telescopes that are placed where the holes would be. They collect the signal coming in from space. And then we know at what time each signal was received by the various telescopes. We essentially plug them all in using wires to a computer that's collecting all the information. Or maybe we put atomic clocks in each one so that we know exactly what time each of the light waves was received. But what we can do is we can essentially combine it in the same way. We can say, okay, this one would take this much time to get to the focus point. This particular wave would take this much time to get to the focus point. And using the timing information of the three telescopes, we can combine essentially the signal we would have gotten if it was Mm -hmm. a 10 kilometer wide uh, tarp covered telescope. Essentially, the argument is the same. We're looking at how the signals from each of those telescopes add together together. So let me ask you a question then, Ben Acker, instead uh, of you asking us. How Uh big can you imagine an interferometer getting? If you could build one at any size and all you have to do is take little telescopes and make them work together, how big can your imagination get? Oh, I got a pretty sweet imagination. All right. Like like professional grade, (laughs) you know? So like it's just a bunch of these – things that add up to a whole picture, right? So you can have yeah. a limitless amount. You can put some on the goddamn moon. I don't care. Nice. There you go. Yeah. Right? So, if you could if you could float them on Saturn, uh, do that, right? Yeah. So one of the things that limits how many dishes we can throw in is mm-hmm. that you have to do something called cross correlation. So I uh, didn't think of cross correlation. <laughs> right. It, oh, my get it. stupid imagination! <laughs> do you so, guys want to start this episode? Don't blame yourself. Oh, terrible. Good. Just talk about the gym class. <laughs> I got those guys. <laughs> so Ben was talking about measuring the delays between the signals that you're getting from each one of these dishes. And 
that means you have to look at antenna one and compared to antenna two, the signals that you're getting. And then you have to look at antenna one compared to antenna three and then compared to antenna four. And then you have to start comparing antenna two to every other antenna. And so that adds up pretty quickly in terms of how many calculations you have to do. You do this on a computer, right? Like this is yes. somebody with a gridded notebooks writing. It's college. like a big switchboard. So, yeah, it's, it's like... You know, ENIAC, a, t- a two-inch tall ENIAC or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But our, our computers are still only so good. And so that's one of the things that limits how many antennas you can throw into the mix. One of our biggest, baddest interferometers it has a 17 petaflop correlator. So Whoa. that peta is 10 to the 15, so 15 zeros. And that's how many calculations it does per second. Okay. That seems like plenty. Is it a Mac? <laughs> you want to get a Mac. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that interferometer has 66 antennas, 66 dishes. All right. Then that's how many? 66, right? The biggest number. Is that the but biggest one? It's the biggest where it's all in one spot. So you hit on something else that is a super neat trick, which is having dishes that maybe aren't all in the right spot, but lots spread out over the world. And so we do that too. We have something called very long baseline astronomy where we have telescopes in Alaska and then one in St. Croix. Is and that, then, did a British person name that? St. <laughs> Croix, yes. No, 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 not St. Croix in Alaska. Very long baseline sounds so respectful and simple and like, this is what it is. Very long baseline. You, you're coming from a place where you're saying interferometer a lot. And then you're like, and then we have one called the very long version. <laughs> oh, you would be surprised. We also have the, we have the very large array. <laughs> I love it. So lar- large array wasn't taken, but I guess they decided that let's just go for very right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. right? It goes to 11. <laughs> this array goes to 11. And there's also in optical, there's the very large telescope. So I guess we're just not that creative. I guess that's yeah. the problem. There, there's one in India that I've used called the giant meter wave radio telescope. Ooh. Yeah. So they're like right. very sounds big, but giant sounds even bigger. Yeah, but the gigantic one dwarfs the giant one. Oh, man, but it'd be the same acronym. How could they do that? <sighs> oh, man, <laughs> you're going to make our robot's brain explode. <laughs> Maybe you could just spell it with bigger letters. <laughs> yes, font-based. <laughs> yeah. So, Sabrina, would you keep rattling off about these big, crazy facilities? Because there's one that correlates all of them across, like, continents, right? Yeah, so the the very long baseline array, and so it's a kind of very long baseline interferometry is what it's called. But yeah, these telescopes are spread out all over the world within reason. You can't have too many that are too far north versus too far south because when you're in the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere, you can see different parts of the sky because the Earth is a ball, you may know. So they're mostly spread out in the northern hemisphere, this VLBA, this very long baseline array. And you can get very, very exquisite detail because you have these telescopes spread out. And so it's used for things like uh, like the Navy uses it to monitor the positions of distant, distant galaxies that are super bright called quasars. And the Navy's interest in this is that in case the enemy ever shoots down our GPS satellites, we'll still know where we're going because, you know, the enemy can never shoot down (laughs) the quasars, I guess. They can't shoot down the distant galaxies, uh, but they can take out our GPS satellites in this way, uh, at least in North America. We'll still know where we're going. Uh, And then... Fate. You're daring enemies to shoot down our quasars. <laughs> no, nothing nothing impossibly happened to our quasars. I defy the gods to prove me wrong. <laughs> well, yeah, so another thing you can use these VLBA antennas, these radio telescopes for, is you can use them in reverse. And the whole point is to look at detailed images of the sky based on the different, the time delay and the signals you get. So how long it takes for a signal in space to get to each telescope, you add up the delays, and that gives you information about the position of what you're looking at in space. But you can use it backwards, and you can study the plate tectonics on Earth because the plates on Earth shift over time, right? So this is plate tectonics. We get earthquakes Mm -hmm. and, and all that good stuff. So we can actually measure 
very precisely the different distances between these telescopes that are spread out over the northern hemisphere and get, they shift on something like a millimeter each year. And we can actually measure that tiny, tiny difference. And it tells us about where the plates on Earth are moving. So you can oh, use so it. smart. To, I know. <laughs> you, you said that like I was sad about it. <laughs> <laughs> so moral of the story is interferometry is essentially when we ask the telescopes involved to take account of when they received each of the signals so that we can recreate we, <clears throat> essentially uh, a really, really big, large telescope by combining their signals in different ways. And the important thing here is that doing so gives us stronger angular re resolution. So we have a better sense of which directions precisely the signal's coming in from. So adding 17 more telescopes in conjunction doesn't produce a brighter signal. We don't receive more photons than each of the 17 telescopes acquire, but it does let us say, yes, that particular radio source is really, really tiny and is coming from exactly that direction in the sky. And this one's coming from exactly that direction in the sky. It's essentially giving us a stronger ability to pinpoint uh, different sources of radio and to image different sources of radio. So how does it get used, you guys? Uh, haunted houses. Uh, <laughs> haunted um, houses. What else? Mm, uh, <clears throat> surprise parties. Uh, <laughs> mm, I didn't know. Is this a time segment? Is this a lightning round? Uh, <laughs> no. Um, yes. Pat. Uh, <laughs> so, well, a, a couple, oh, you a couple of take. things that we want to do with radio astronomy um, in general and with interferometers in particular is to compare what we see in those wavelengths of light versus what we're already seeing in the optical part of the spectrum. And sometimes it's pretty crazy. Like you can look at a galaxy – in the optical, like you're just taking a regular visual picture with a regular old reflecting telescope and the galaxy will look just like your typical spiral galaxy and suddenly you look at it in the radio part of the spectrum and it has these two giant jets of something coming out of them perpendicular to the, the direction of the galaxy um, at speeds approaching the speed of light and suddenly you're like, wow, that normal looking galaxy actually has – a supermassive black hole in the middle of it that's like ejecting matter out at crazy speeds at huge, huge distances. Um, we wouldn't have discovered so many things without uh, looking at different wavelengths of light uh, and radio astronomy in particular. Yeah, and so one of the things that I use radio interferometry for is looking at how stars form. This is actually something we don't understand the process very well, and part of it is because stars form when you take clouds of gas and you collapse them down, eventually things get hot and dense enough so that you get hydrogen fusion, which starts a star. But this is all happening when shrouded in dust and gas and all of this space junk and optical light doesn't make it out. And so without radio wavelengths, without longer wavelengths that can make it out of these clouds to tell us what's going on inside them, much like only the radio wavelengths are getting through some of our atmosphere, but here even optical light isn't getting out, then we can tell more about this process. And then stars do crazy stuff, like once they form, they'll fuse other elements, and then when they die, they explode and send those elements back out into this gas and dust called the interstellar medium, and this process is called feedback, where you're getting stars are giving back to their environments, and we don't understand the interplay between stars living their lives and the gas around them very well, just because we've never been able to penetrate these areas with the resolution that we now are just starting to be able to do with radio interferometry. So, Ben Acker, I, I think there's probably like a, a question you might have right now, and let me help you state it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like now that we've created interferometry for radio telescopes, you might be asking yourselves, well, why don't we do it for other telescopes? If those other telescopes already have better resolution, wouldn't an interferometer in, say, the optical part be like a crazy, crazy high resolution telescope? And, and the answer is yes, but overall, it's just harder to do. And so we've just started to sort of scratch the surface on taking this 
technique that you know we're pros at in the radio part of the spectrum and use it on smaller and smaller wavelengths. And just recently, a brand new telescope, I would argue maybe the best telescope in the entire world right now, opened up called ALMA. Um, it's in Chile. It's called the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And it, it's really just begun, but it's going to revolutionize our understanding of so many processes, including a lot of the ones that Sabrina was talking about. Yeah, so ALMA is actually the telescope that has the 17 peta flop correlator. Oh, that and was the one you were talking about? Okay. Yes. So ALMA is badass, not only because it has this great resolution and sensitivity, but it also is opening up frequency space. So new wavelengths of light that we haven't really been able to look at before. And so it's showing us a lot of different molecules in space in other galaxies we haven't seen before. And so these different molecules, uh, you can look at interacting galaxies, for example. So when two galaxies slam into each other, you get all sorts of shock waves going off that produce extreme environments for star formation. And this can produce a lot of different molecules that we don't see normally in other places. And so Alma, one of the things Alma is doing is looking at these different environments and looking at these new molecules. So there's this whole area of astrochemistry that is really taking off right now because of what Alma can do. So when you guys talk about, like among yourselves, seeing molecules in other galaxies, right? Like that's a thing you just said we can do, right? Yes. Does your brain basically go bananas? Are you like, man, we can see molecules in other galaxies. Science is awesome and like high five each other in the halls of the science building. Or are you like, yeah, yeah, you can see molecules in other galaxies. But what we're really interested in is something even cooler and more per my interests or something like that. Like, are you just constantly in a state of like, whoa, things are awesome. Cause that's a, that's a great question. Like for me personally, sometimes I do find like in science meetings and, and stuff like that, that it does get sort of blase, but, but the great part for me is sharing it with students, you know, mm-hmm. like when we talk to people um, who, who, you know, aren't blase about it, who have, you know, for the very first time understanding what we're doing, that's when I realized, oh my God, this is, this is incredible. We are, mm-hmm. and, and again, with this podcast, same sort of thing where it's just, uh, um, sometimes you, you begin to get a, a larger picture of the enormity of, of some of the things that, that we're able to do as opposed to, you know, worrying about the error or the dirtiness of your data and all that, that minutia stuff that, that gets in the way of, of the big Your bottom thing. line, your monthly bottom line, your boss is on your ass about how many totally. molecules. And, uh, you got to clear these. <laughs> and if I had better telescopes to Glenn Gary telescopes, we could work this out. <laughs> right on. It's great that you find a way to be blown away by it so regularly. Yeah. So uh, we were talking about these antennas, these di- multiple different dishes. So Alma has 66 dishes. Well, it will when it's completed. It's still in the process. But we don't just put these antennas out there and then sit them. We move them constantly in and out. So where they're closer together and then further apart. Because we were talking about as you spread them out, that gives you the benefit of this better resolution, but you're still making bigger and bigger cracks that light can fall through, right? So sometimes we want them spread out as far as we can to get the best resolution, but sometimes we want them closer in. So we sacrifice a little bit in our ability to pick out that detail, but in exchange, we get a better filling in something called longer spatial scales. So we can see more spread out stuff. And so we want to be able to go back and forth between these modes to get the most out of our telescopes. So each one of the dishes for Alma is 100 tons. And so you have to be able to move a 100-ton thing and then place it. And the placement where you put them has to be right to within a few millimeters. So you have to have something that can transport these things pretty constantly and also be able to place it within a few millimeters of where you actually want it so that you can get it into the right spot. So they had to build these special transporters in order to do this. So they only have two because they're super specialized and expensive, as you can imagine. Uh, They've named them Otto and Lori because, you know, we're fond of them. Uh, But these transporters have something like 28 or 30 tires each 
And they're like six meters high, 20 meters around. And they, they also have to be able to work at elevation. So Alma is up in the Atacama Desert, which is at elevation. It's at about 5,000 meters up. So also machinery doesn't like to work as well up there. So they, they just had to make these super specialized transporters. And so it's really cool to see them in action. Although I recommend they have videos of them online, but you should watch it in speed up mode because they can't go over like 20 kilometers per hour. So they're really, really slow, but they're super amazing that they've had to build these special transporters just to move these dishes around. In the Pixar movie, would the transporters be blue collar and, and all would be like a fancy lady? Yes. There would be like a snobs versus slob situation. Sure, sure. Don't placate me. I'm curious. <laughs> well, so the guy that drives the transporter. Oh, there's a guy that drives it? Yeah. Well, so you can remote control it. But for when the guy wants to get in, they have to make a special seat. The driver's seat has like this pouch, this indent in the back for his oxygen tank. Whoa. Because it's so high up. That what kind of guy have... is he? Is he a scientist or is he like a jock? Well, like that's the thing. It's like, is this a guy who is driving transports and there's just one on his list? Who's this guy? That's my question. Who's this guy? Well, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that they're generally not scientists. I'm pretty sure I couldn't go up there and be like, hey, guys, could I move this dish a little bit because it's a little bit off? I'm uh-huh. pretty sure they wouldn't let me as a scientist just hop in there and use there. They're technicians, though, right? Not like ground, groundskeepers. It takes skill, for sure. But like, so does, so does a, a union guy driving a truck, right? Like a teamster. Right. I mean, you got to be somewhere high up on the pay scale if they're letting you move this really expensive dish <laughs> and on a really expensive transporter. Yeah. What does he do the rest of the time? Is he like Indiana Jones? Like, ah, I'll move this transporter for science and stuff. <laughs> Because, yeah, science, and now i got to go swing on a thing and then punch a Nazi. Probably not punch a Nazi. <laughs> but, like, you guys, you don't know the inner life of the guy who drives the transport? Oh, I do okay. not. All right. I will, Look, I'll try is, to set up a pen pal situation with him and get back I to you. I appreciate it. I thought this was a comprehensive <laughs> podcast. I guess I'm mistaken. <laughs> so, like, we've talked a lot about angular resolution and, and things like that, but, but maybe we don't really understand how accurate we can actually be. The smallest I've seen an interferometer uh, apparently work, it was the equivalent of being able to see the head of a screw 300 kilometers away, just to give you an idea of what kind of tiny, tiny sizes we're talking about. You can, you can see a molecule in another galaxy, though, right? Yeah, when we say we see a molecule in another galaxy, we, sh- we, should, we should add a little addendum that we can't resolve the molecule different materials emit different colored light. And so the deal is if you can recognize those types of light, you can recognize, you can identify what material or what chemicals emitting the light. And so what they're saying is now this thing is so sweet that it can, can see frequencies of radio that we hadn't previously been able to, to measure, and we can use those to detect Uh, chemical signatures that we weren't able to see before. All right. I think that's probably still impressive. It's still impressive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't get to guys. Don't get down on yourselves. (laughs) Oh no. Keep high five. I've done it before. Always science. Yeah. Right. There it is. Yeah. Find the silver lining. I don't know. Is there anything really crazy in the radio that we've discovered? That's what pulsars are. So in a star, a normal star, it is fusing elements, which creates photons, it emits this light out, and it prevents the gravitational collapse of the star. So basically, the star starts from this collapsing cloud, but eventually something starts fighting back against that collapse. And that's when fusion happens, it starts emitting all these photons, all this light that has some sort of radiation pressure that fights back. But eventually, it's going to run out of material to fuse through and burn in the core. And then that gravitational collapse is going to win out. And depending on how big the star was to start with, uh, you can end up with different things. Like something like our sun, a star the size of our sun, is going to turn into something called a white dwarf, which is basically a bunch of electrons packed together. 
Uh, and then slightly bigger stars will end up in something called a neutron star. So this is held together by something called neutron degeneracy pressure, which basically says neutrons can't get any closer together. Quantum mechanics sets a limit, and these neutrons, as there's nothing fighting back against gravitational collapse, eventually the neutrons are like, okay, no more, we will not be crushed any closer together. And that can support the star for a while. But it does this weird thing to emissions from the star that are left over in the core making their way out where it gets beamed out either direction. Uh, So rather than emitting light at all, all around, like an orb, like the sun, instead you get this sort of beamed emission out either pole and if this and this star as it rotates if it's pointed the right way we fall in the path of this beam and we can see it and it's uh so this these are called that's why they're called pulsars because they we see a pulsing uh and we can find millisecond pulsars meaning the we can see pulses on order of happening every millisecond so these are really really fast spinning stars and where we detect these emissions is in the radio wavelengths so we can see that these stars are out there pulsing and so it tells us a lot about our understanding of what happens to stars when they die our understanding of what happens in the presence of a of a strong gravitational field uh, because neutron stars are super super dense objects i think it's like taking the mass of the sun and cramming it into something the size of Manhattan. So it's like super, super dense. And so this creates crazy physics around the object because the gravity is so strong. And so they tell us also about that physics, uh, general relativity, uh, stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. But you missed the crazy part, which is they detected it in the 60s and they thought it was aliens. So (laughs) they had this radio telescope and they were just kind of poking around with it. And then they got the signal that was regular. It was like beep, beep. Beep, 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 beep. And they're like, what could be making that pulse? Because it's totally regular. And they were like, oh, it must be aliens. Mm -hmm. But then it wasn't. It's these spinning neutron stars, which are fascinating. But, you know, if you ever think astronomers aren't immediately about to say, oh, it was aliens, you're wrong. Because they heard this and they were like, yeah, it's probably aliens. Wasn't there aliens like six months ago, three months ago, something like that? The alien megastructure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Astronomers are like... Probably aliens. When we get interviewed, we have to say that it's probably not aliens to keep people from panicking, but it's probably aliens. And then it's not, and they're disappointed, but astronomers are a hardy bunch. Rapinder, what were you going to say about Jocelyn Bell? Uh, Yeah, so if I'm not mistaken, wasn't it Jocelyn Bell who made the uh, original observation for the pulsars? Right, but she didn't get credit. Right, she had one of those supervisors. Ugh. So her supervisor like got the Nobel Prize. What? And he was also the guy that was all like, hmm, looks like aliens. I, I feel like he was probably <laughs> like, I think I've discovered something great here. And he's all like, probably aliens. Oh, I would watch this show. Yeah. Her being a woman was no small part in that either. Yeah. No, it was It was all because of that. I, I think at, at that time, she was definitely a pioneer and uh, did not get due credit for um, – Um, one of the most important astronomical discoveries of the 1900s. Well, that was fun. Thank you, Rapinder. Thank you, Sabrina. You've pleased me. Your efforts have borne fruit, and that fruit is sweet. Here is some fruit. Rapinder, you get a mango. Oh, yeah. Um, 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 um. And Sabrina, you get a grape. (laughs) I'd like to thank my guest, Ben Acker. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Remember, if you want to hear the Work Juice Theater is doing a show on San Francisco at Sketchfest in January. And all our podcasts are up on iTunes and Nerdist and everywhere. Podcasts are cast podwise and always will be. enjoy those lovely podcasts and comic books and stuff. Yeah, right? Thanks. Thanks for having me. You are a lovely host. And uh, I feel like I learned at least three things today. (laughs) That's good. Oh, wow. That was fun. Okay, so now it's announcement time. First, I was thinking that around this time of the year, people go poking around for new podcasts to listen to on their fancy new devices while they sit in the airport or on the bus or in their long car trips to visit their great aunts or get away from their great aunts, in fact. Now, I was thinking it might be time to remind the world that we exist. So, if you'd like to help us promote ourselves, you can give us an iTunes review. 
iTunes ranks their shows according to how many reviews they're getting each month. And so if our review numbers go up just a little bit, more people will see us and more people will try us and more people will learn lovely, fantastic physics explained by brilliant people to clever, clever lay people. Okay, now... In other news, transcriptions are firing on all cylinders. We've got a dozen done. More are on the way. Uh, Email me if you're interested in trying your hand at transcribing an episode, and we'll talk about the details. And on that note, we're still humbly soliciting your donations. Your donations going to paying our server fees and also our ambitious project to get all the episodes transcribed. This particular episode of the Titanium Physicist has been sponsored by a collection of generous, generous people. I'd like to thank the generosity of Seth Horgan. I'd also like to thank Melissa Burke, Yassin Urzazi, Spider Rogue, Insanity Orbits, Robin Johnson, Madame Sandra Johnson, Mr. Jacob Wick, Mr. John Keyes, uh, Mr. Victor C., Ryan Kloss, Peter Klipsham, Mr. Robert Halpin, Elizabeth Teresa, and Paul Carr, uh, Mr. Ryan Newell, Mr. Adam K., Thomas Cherrier, and a Mr. Jacob S., a gentleman named Brett Evans, a lady named Jill, a gentleman named Greg, thanks, Steve, Mr. James Clausen, Mr. Devin North, a gentleman named Scott, Ed Lowlington, Kelly Wienersmith, Jocelyn Reed, a Mr. S. Hatcher, Mr. Rob Abrazado, and Mr. Robert Stietka. So, that's it for Titanium Physicists this time. Remember that if you like listening to scientists talk about science in their own words, there are lots and lots of other lovely shows on the Bracula Media Network. The intro song to our show is by Ted Leo and the Pharmacists, and the end song is by John Vanderslice. So, good day, my friends, and until next time, remember to keep science in your hearts. to tell you dear before you come back here I lost I lost your bunny I let him out of the cage he was eating spring mix on the carpet jumped through a window out into the haze hop down magnolia Okay, wait. This is, I'm, I'm following, but I'm getting distracted. Repinder, do you have a planet that you like better than Earth? <laughs> uh, Sabrina, you're next. Uh, ben, Earth ben, is my favorite planet. What's your planet. favorite planet? Earth is your uh, favorite planet. To be, to be honest, Earth is my favorite planet. Yeah, Earth. It's great. We're from here. I, it's where I keep all my stuff. It's true. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sabrina. Uh, Earth is definitely my favorite planet because I have a very narrow range of temperatures at which I am comfortable. Yeah. So regular here it is. stuff. All right, great, Ben. I'm gonna say Saturn. Oh, <laughs> and there's always one. <laughs> I liked it, uh, and it's got a ring on it. So and it would float in a bathtub. <laughs> it would float in a bathtub. It's fun all the time. <laughs> oh, that sounds like another podcast. <laughs> You're not going to tell me why it would float in a bathtub, are you? Uh, it's just less dense than water, so it would float. Even though it's super, super massive, if you could get a bathtub that could fit Saturn, it would float. It's very fluffy. Oh, sure. If I can get a bathtub fluffy. bigger than Saturn, man, I'd be set. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'll you see. could you... prove me right or wrong. <laughs> well, no, yeah, but it wouldn't be about that. It would be like, that's a guy who can get a bathtub bigger than Saturn. <laughs> I wonder what kind of car he drives. I wonder what planet <laughs> it's bigger than, you know? <laughs> Anyway, you were saying about this topic. <laughs> oh, um, but first of all, yes. uh, yay Earth. Good job, guys. Okay. Except, for, except for you, Ben. Sorry. <laughs> hate Earth. You should get a t-shirt. It's Love it or leave it, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Love it or leave it. Yeah, not to get all Trump on you. <laughs> <laughs> also, something they use radio interferometry for is, I don't know if we want to talk about this, but for SETI. 
for the search for extraterrestrial life because if you were to fly over our solar system, no offense to Saturn, but you would know right away that Earth is where all the intelligent life action is because we're emitting tons of radio emissions. So all our communications, you know, cell phones, cable TV, we do a lot of stuff in the radio regime. And so all of this is just, you know, shooting off like crazy off Earth. And so you can tell that there's intelligent life here because of the radio emissions. So some astronomers think that if we look long enough in radio waves, uh, we can, and search enough of the universe, we can find other intelligent life like ourselves. Hey, incidentally, you know how in the Lord of the Rings movie, nope. how... Uh... Never seen it. Nope. How Legolas nope. looks like a hundred kilometers away and tells them how many horses there are and stuff. Nope. I mean, I trust that it happened. Oh, I'm just wondering how big his eyes would actually need to be to be able to resolve that distance. He's got big uh, eyes. It's elfin powers. Yeah, but he must have big eyes, right? Like, I know that they had to ha- find the handsomest person to play him in the movie, but he has to have he succeeded, really right? big eyes, right? Yeah, I know. She's real pretty. Like anime <laughs> eyes. Yeah, I never. If if it's not about saving Christmas, elves need to shut up. That's my that's my thing. Like I can't take an elf that takes itself seriously seriously. So like people love it, it's fine. Go ahead, like that stuff. But it's I, it's not my thing. But but you're down with like trolls and stuff, right? I'm sorry. No, you're down with like trolls. No, like it's all of a piece. Like I'm not much of a of a um, a fantasy swords and sorcery guy. I'm I'm much more robots and and uh, time traveling Nazis. <laughs> You're in the right place, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, I'm just saying. Like, I feel bad that I I, sh- I shoot down your Lord of the Rings thing, but it's okay. Not. Uh, when when one writes long essays at the start of these things, one thinks about strange things. Sure. Yeah. No. It's <laughs> it's an apt illustration. Of like, I bet Rapinder would know the answer to this. Yeah. Yeah. And you, while you've got him, you got to ask it. It's not. Con- yeah. Um, my appreciation for those are the latter works of Peter Jackson. Well, may, maybe if he did know it, you'd be really impressed. It was yeah. a it was a long gamble. Right. Uh, yeah, that one dude. The, the, the computer generated Elijah Wood guy, Gollum. Yeah, giant eyes. It's true because he Elijah lived in the dark. And Elijah Wood also giant eyes. You're right. Elijah, maybe they can see really far. Elijah Wood can see more heads of screws than me. Because <laughs> he's like his head is like two thirds eyes, probably. Does that that help? Is that helpful? Do you want to take this whole thing back? That is helpful. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <I dare> you. <laughs> well, I mean, if we want to talk a little bit of biology, it's kind of cool too, right? So it's like our atmosphere only lets in light from space, including the sun, in the visible part of the spectrum, the part we can see, and the radio part of the spectrum. And so, a long, long time ago, before there was a, such a thing as sight, evolution sort of decided that we were going to develop these things that were sensitive to this light that was present on Earth. But um, imagine some kind of biological organism that that was sensitive to radio light. Their eyeballs would be this meters large. It would be disgusting. Yeah. What if trees can see in radio? Oh, man. Because they're about the right width. What yeah. if they're talking to each other about us in radio? We would have heard that, right, Sabrina? Yeah. yeah. Okay. If, is this, is this a, if a tree falls in the forest? No, this is if a tree bad. gossips about you. Do you go and you <laughs> cut that tree down because shut up? Can you locate which tree was the gossip? Yeah. Is Arecibo wide enough to, <laughs> to or, figure out which, or which tree, tree was talking or, or about us? a bunch of trees all gossip Spartacuses. <laughs> which tree <laughs> said that thing about my fat ankles? I'll never tell. <laughs> I said it. No, I said it. All right. <laughs> Nature's gossips. <laughs> 